Hi everyone, I'm Claire and today at the National Space Centre I'm going to be learning more about the International Space Station. First up, I'm going to meet Charlie, who's going to tell me what the ISS is. It's basically a giant floating space lab, somewhere where astronauts can go to do research in a weightless environment. Here at the National Space Centre we have a model of the International Space Station. Here you can see all the modules that are on board that make up the entire thing. In real life, it's 50 times bigger than this, around about the size of a football field. It has lots of different things on board. So there are six bedrooms, a gymnasium, research modules, but also, more recently, it's got an observatory called the Cupola, which means astronauts can view our very own planet Earth from space. So you'll notice on the side of the International Space Station are these big solar panels. They absorb the energy from the sun and run the equipment on board. Around 50 computers run all the systems. And because of its proximity from our planet Earth, 250 miles above the surface, the size of it, around about the size of a football field, and the reflection of light off those solar arrays, it makes it the second brightest object in our night sky. The ISS orbits the Earth every 90 minutes, approximately 400 kilometres above the surface. So in 24 hours, they orbit the Earth 16 times, meaning they get to witness 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets. But there's no engine pushing it along. So how does it orbit the Earth and not fall to the ground? I need a costume change. The ISS was put into space piece by piece and built in orbit by astronauts and robotics. To remain in orbit, it needs to travel at a certain speed. That speed is roughly 17,150 miles per hour, or 5 miles per second. It has a sideways speed, but gravity pulls it down. Imagine this ball is the ISS, and I'm the Earth. If it travels too slowly, it won't be able to overcome Earth's gravity, and it will get pulled to the ground. But if it goes too fast, it will be able to escape Earth's gravity and get a further and further orbit before maybe even escaping it entirely and flying out into space. But get the right speed and it curves down towards the Earth and at the same rate the Earth curves away from it, allowing it to stay in orbit. So that's how the ISS is staying in orbit, but how are things floating on board? You may think there is no gravity in space, but a small amount of gravity can be found everywhere. It's what keeps the moon in orbit around the Earth, and keeps the planets in orbit around the Sun. Gravity is weaker with distance. The ISS has 90% of Earth's gravity, so why does it look like there's none? Well, the spacecraft, its crew, and everything aboard are all falling around the Earth. Since they're all falling together, the crew and objects appear to float. The effect can be found on Earth, created by planes, something called parabolic flight, also known as the vomit comet. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as anti-gravity rooms. And we don't have one here at the National Space Centre. So if you want to experience real microgravity, you're going to have to travel to the ISS. But how do we get there? Let's go and ask Josh. So Josh, how do we get into space? Well Claire, the first thing we're going to need is one of these. A spacesuit just like the one that Tim Peake wore when he went to space. Now this is a so-called suit, it's a Russian suit, and it's used to keep you safe during takeoff and during landing. Now usually the spacecraft's going to do that for you, but just in case something went wrong, this suit will keep the oxygen and pressure environment to get you back to Earth. You're also going to need one of these, a spacecraft to take you into space. Now this is one of the longest serving human rated vehicles. It's called a Soyuz capsule. It launches on a Soyuz rocket. Built by the Russians, it's been in use for about 50 years in various different forms. Now, this itself takes you to space. To get there only takes a few minutes, but to reach the space station can take a little longer. Initially, it used to take the spacecraft two whole days where you'd live on board. Nowadays, we've got a little bit more of an efficient route, so it only takes about an hour or so for you to rendezvous. Now, at the moment, this isn't the only method. As I mentioned, this is an old spacecraft. We've got some new upcoming ones, uh, like the Dragon 2 capsule from SpaceX. And the best thing about these capsules is not only do they take you up to space, but they bring you back as well. The capsule will stay docked to the space station and then it will return. 
Now, not all of it gets back safely. In fact, with the Soyuz, it's only the middle section that makes it all the way back down to the Earth. The front and back, they burn up on re-entry. Hopefully not something that's gonna to happen to you. So that's how you get to space and how you get back, but living and working in space is incredibly tricky. I think you should go off and learn about space. Yeah, I'm gonna go and talk to Dan, our curator, and tell me more about living in space. Hi Dan, I've uh, seen you got some food already out for us. Food's very important to me, down here on Earth. What's it like to in space? Uh, yeah, it's really important for them as well. I mean, they're, they're up there doing experiments, but it's very important that we can uh, feed the astronauts, keep them alive. And, um, they do that in a slightly different way in some respects, but ultimately they all have the same goal, which is to make sure we've got the right nutrition to keep them fit and healthy for the number of months that they're up there. Um, they, they generally tend to have three main different types of food and ways of preparing that food. So firstly, there's something called natural form food, so something like these almonds. So something that you could, you know, M&M's, whatever it might be, something that you could just eat as is. But all that has to happen with that, it has to be vacuum packed, secure, uh, in packaging a little bit like this one. Other types of food though, like this one, which is a, a very appetizing looking tuna salad, uh, but it's dehydrated. And the idea behind that is you're gonna take all the moisture out of it, um, partly because it keeps it as nutritious as it possibly can be. Also helps to remove any sort of pathogens and nasty bugs that mean that it might go off. But also it's a lot lighter when you take the water out of it. Then when you're up in space, all you need to do is plug it in. It's got a, a, a part here that you would put into the water supply, rehydrate it, and it suddenly becomes much more edible than it currently looks. This particular one was flown around the moon on Apollo 16, uh, but never eaten. And I think perhaps understand yeah. why. That's the thing with any sort of science centre or museum that has space food, the stuff that you see is the stuff that wasn't eaten, so it's perhaps an unfair reflection sometimes on how appetising it might be. Which then takes you on to things like thermostabilised food, like this truffled beef stew which was designed for Tim Peaks, which is very nice. Um, and the idea behind that is it goes into a special contraption, a bit like an oven, looks a bit like a toaster, and it cooks the food at a low level for a long time to get rid of all the nasty pathogens um, and, and things that might make the food rot. And then basically it gets tinned, so it's like tinned food. This stuff's very special though because the uh, Tim Peaks mission who worked with Hester Blumenthal, the celebrity chef, to come up with some of these meals and Hester realised that if you're going to be on the International Space Station for six months, a year almost sometimes, it's a long time to be separated from your friends and family. So all of the meals that he came up with would remind him of his friends, his family, his, his wife for example, with his truffled beef stew was here to remind him of a particular happy memory of a romantic meal out, which is nice. And then of course we've got the, uh, the bacon sarnet as well, which is the first food that Tim ate when he went into space. Uh, and Hester came up with this idea of using very dense bread because you don't want um, a normal sandwich which is going to break apart and crumb and start floating around. So he did that and uh, sealed it in a tin and that's the first thing that Tim ate when he went, it was on his Rikipia mission. I think like, I'd like that for my first meal as well, bacon sandwich, very nice. So if you're eating a lot of food, you're inevitably going to need the toilet. You are, and that's the other thing that is uh, something that they do in space, much the same as we do, but in a different way. So here on Earth, we've got gravity helping us to get the material away from our body and into the toilet. Now, they have gravity on the International Space Station, they're falling around Earth, but it's a weightless microgravity environment, which means that if you go to the toilet, everything is just going to start floating away from you. So the toilet that they have on the International Space Station is very similar to one that you can see on display here at the Space Centre. Um, and our one comes from the same era as the uh, Media Space Station, the International Space Station toilet is developed and designed on that. It's basically a, a giant vacuum tube. So it's using fans to draw material away from the body so that as you go to the toilet, that material gets sucked into the system um, and uh, acts in the same way that gravity is acting with that toilet down here on Earth. However, it's even cleverer than that these days up there in space in that their toilet can also take the urine and process it using acids and filters and various other processes to reconvert it back into drinkable water, which is really important if we're ever going to get to the point where we can travel to Mars or the moon, long duration missions where you can't resupply with more water all the time. And it's incredibly clean, it's perfectly safe, but ultimately they're drinking the water that's already been through their system once or twice. So. Yeah, it sounds a bit gross, but I've heard it's even cleaner than Earth's. It is, yeah, absolutely. Perfectly safe, incredibly clean, but yeah, it's something you still have to get your head around, I think, if you're an astronaut. You're going to be ultimately drinking stuff that's already been through the process. I'm sure you get this. You did pass the time, yeah, I'm sure. If you're eating and toilet habits, 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a very comfortable uh, sleep problem in the space station. They only have um, small compartments that they can sleep in. You've got one on the floor, on the ceiling, on the walls, but ultimately there is no ceiling floor when you're on there, uh, when you're on there in space, there's a lot down. But they have small uh, compartments that they can get into and sleeping bags. And the idea being that the sleeping bag means that they can fix themselves if they want to. They might want to just float through. Some of the astronauts prefer that. It's a very comfortable sleep, as you might imagine, where you've got no, nothing to support you and you're just floating around. But if they don't seal themselves into their sleeping bag, naturally their hands start just to float around and they wake up in the morning like this. But um, yeah, ultimately it's a really pleasant experience. Thank you so much, Dan, for showing me all this. No, I really just want to eat that bacon. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure how edible any of this would be now, but <laughs> I'd give it a go. <laughs> When astronauts aren't eating, sleeping and using the toilet, they're conducting experiments in a way that cannot be done anywhere else. The space station is the only place available for long duration microgravity research. They have a unique vantage point of Earth, helping us respond to natural disasters. They're doing research into diseases such as Alzheimer's, cancer and asthma. Growing crystals to develop new medications, growing food and even baking cookies. So next time you look up and spot the station, think of all these things they're doing to help us down here on Earth. I am very dizzy. <laughs>